I've been off work since 11.30. Been killing time all afternoon here in Bentonville. <laughs> Got my nails done, went to the movies. Good for you. Went to set up the payment plan for my doctor bill. I did it productive. What'd you go see? Uh, that new movie called Escape. It was good. If you like, if you like the action movies, you know, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, Sylvester Stallone. Do they escape? Yeah, they get out of it. <laughs> but they look a lot older than they used to. Oh yeah, they, they, they are really old. Like it's a geriatric escape. It was good. <laughs> you know what? I really think that speaks to hormones because you know these people in Hollywood have access to yeah. everything. The best. So. If you want to stay young, you know, they have access to the doctor. Say everything to make them stay young. Yeah, stay young. That's really I don't know, they look pretty old in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're not so caught up on that. <laughs> yay, hormones! My favorite topic. <laughs> oh, yay. Yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I'm such a nerd with this stuff. <laughs> so, I want to kind of give you just an idea overall, and this will kind of tie in both with insulin and with all the other hormones too. Um, insulin is your sugar storage hormone. And insulin is tricky because when it works right, everything stays in balance. And when it doesn't work right, everything just goes to, you know, heck in a hand basket kind of thing. So we want to keep insulin happy. And the biggest problem with insulin is sugar in our society. We are a sweet, sweet, sweet society, and it just doesn't work. And the problem with sugar, and I'm just going to use the term glucose interchangeably with sugar. Sugar is really actually many different molecules, glucose, fructose, sucrose, lots of different molecules. But just for the sake of keeping things simple, I'll just say sugar. The problem with too much sugar is that insulin is um, very patient and very kind, but it, it gets taxed and it, it, it gives up easily. And some people genetically it gives up easier than others. And when that happens, we call that insulin resistant. And we just really push it in our Western society because there's sugar everywhere. There's sugar in everything. You read labels and it's sugar, sugar, sugar. Ketchup, like the second ingredient after tomato is sugar. So really we have to have this awareness that we're just not meant to have this much sugar. And we certainly weren't meant to drink sugar. So uh, the soda industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and people are drinking huge amounts of sugar every day. I don't know if I've ever showed you guys this. I'm a big Hobby Lobby fan, so I'd love to get little bottles and trinkets and stuff. This is the amount of sugar, I'm gonna pass this around, in a big gulp. Oh my God! <laughs> and a big gulp is usually, I think it's, I want to say it's like 30, 20, 32, 32 or 32 ounces. ounces you know. <laughs> I don't know, but what is maybe bigger than that? Yeah. Because it's like, you know, one of those yeah, big cups, like about that I big around the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it is. I thought it was like 64 or something like that. Holy yeah. cow, that's a lot of sugar. Yeah. Can Can you imagine like just teaspooning that? You couldn't do it. So, I mean, it's really, if you can't teaspoon that much, you shouldn't be drinking that much in a, in a solution. Um, you all ever had or heard of a glucose tolerance test? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's when you go to the doctor and they basically give you this much sugar. It's like a flat Coca-Cola. And they give you sugar and they check your insulin and sugar levels at sometimes hours, sometimes two hour intervals. And the reason is, is because most doctors check a sugar level or a glucose level and they'll tell you it looks normal. So what they're doing is they're trying to make your pancreas not work <laughs> or to tax the pancreas <coughs> as much as possible and then see if it can still work under undue circumstances or extreme duress. So doctors have long known that that much sugar in a load is extreme duress for the pancreas. You do that four or five times a day, which many people do. It's very scary. I had a patient, um, it's been about two years ago, a brittle, brittle diabetic, and he ended up losing um, both feet, and I just remember the progression from his toes <coughs> to his ankles. And it turns out that, uh, and he, the damage had really been done by the time he got to me, but it turns out he was a school cook. 
And he was sitting there at the <coughs> sun fountain all day long because that's the way he was hydrating was just Coke, Coke, Coke all day long. Oh, yeah. Can we get you something? You good? <laughs> I'm right up front, right to the right. It's the water cooler, and there should be some little cups. I can get you a bigger cup if you need it. So, I mean, basically, he had no no insulin anymore, no insulin reserve, and he was trying, you know, to keep up, giving himself insulin, trying to keep up with that. And I don't want to scare you with that, but, you know, that just speaks to an extreme circumstance that, you know, some people just can't handle that. So, on your handout, um, I have the little analogy. Um, in my book, I have the analogy of a vacuum cleaner salesman that shows up at the door, and the first time, you know, he he, he goes, you know, he, you buy the vacuum cleaner, and the second time, maybe you buy the attachments. Um, the third time he comes back, you're like, no, 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 we don't want any. So, insulin kind of works the same way. You know, the first time works well, second time maybe works well. <coughs> so if you just keep pushing, 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 um, eventually it'll just go away. And so, very interesting when we check glucose levels on people. The same reason we do the glucose tolerance test is because a lot of doctors don't check an insulin level. So people will look at their sugar level and they'll say, oh, I'm not diabetic. Or they'll look at their sugar level and they'll say, I'm actually hypoglycemic. Have you ever heard that, low mm -hmm. blood sugar? Well, the reason is, is because sugar and insulin are just the opposite. When you have a lot of sugar, insulin is secreted to lower the blood sugar. And then, so sugar's high, insulin comes in, sugar's low. So when you check the sugar, the sugar looks low, but the insulin's high. Well, over time, more and more insulin, lower, lower blood sugar, more and more insulin, lower, lower blood sugar. All of a sudden, oops, no more insulin, high blood sugar. So it's a continuum. I like to think of, well, not like to, but it's just kind of the basic fact. The diabetes should be a verb, not a noun. And what I mean by that is anybody who has insulin resistance is on their way diabetes in to diabetes. So insulin resistance is just a precursor. So some people say, well, I used to be diabetic, but I'm not diabetic anymore. And I hear some doctors say, well, you know, it's like being pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. You're diabetic or you're not. So you can have the genetics for insulin resistance, but you can, you can control things and you can keep things at bay and at balance. But all of us have the potential, and if all of us get overweight long enough, it's just a matter of time before we're diabetic. So, I'm going to show you just the kind of basics of the way a hormone works. Um, so, a hormone molecule maybe looks like this. And here's the cell. And this cell can be a fat cell, it can be a muscle cell, it can be any, any kind of cell in the body, a liver cell. So, the hormone goes to the cell surface and the cell says, do we want you or don't we want you? And if it does want you, there are these receptors on here and these little gates, these little doors that swing open basically. So in insulin resistance, it goes here and if it says, yeah, um, if you have enough sugar in the blood, it says, um, we don't want the sugar in the blood because it's toxic to the blood vessels. Eventually you'll start losing toes and extremities and kidneys and eyes. So we want to get move it out of the bloodstream. So the insulin says, okay, I need to be stored somewhere. And the easiest way is to store it in a fat cell because the fat cells are very, their gates are really loose. <laughs> so the insulin comes over here and it says, okay, fat cell, will you let me in? And so eventually it stops letting you in and your blood sugar stays high. So insulin resistance means that this, kind of, if you think of it like a key analogy, the key gets rusty and some people are, genetically have rustier keys that really don't work well. You try to stick a key in a door that doesn't fit very well or it's maybe rusty or kind of broken. So insulin res resistance is where now the sugar can't even get into the cell anymore and it just sits out here in the bloodstream and becomes toxic and that's when you start to really have bad manifestations. But any hormone works the same way. It goes into the cell and it binds with a receptor inside the cell and then it goes into the DNA and the DNA is just sort of the assembly line, I'll do a double strand here, assembly line for making protein. And the way it does that is it takes all the little amino acids in the body and from the message from the hormone, the hormone goes inside here and it starts this process of attaching amino acids in a certain sequence. And the sequence that it makes is what turns into something called a protein.
And interestingly, these proteins go out in the body and they can either increase or decrease your metabolism. They can increase or they go to other cells and signal those cells to do different things, increase or decrease your bone density. Increase or decrease your sleep. Increase or decrease your mood. Sorry. Increase, you doing okay? Oh yeah, other than wetting my pants, I'm fine. Increase or decrease <laughs> you wetting your pants. <laughs> Increase or decrease any process dot 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 that you can name in your body. Uh, increase or decrease your cholesterol. Increase or so you kind of get the idea. Proteins do all that stuff. So that's the way it works. It goes in. Now there's something called epigenetics, and the way epigenetics work is genetics is sort of the assembly line, the workers that you're stuck with, sort of in a factory, the workers that are there. Epigenetics is what actually gets made off the assembly line. So maybe one day in the shirt factory, you're making polo shirts, but you can send the signals to change over and make tank tops. So that's what epigenetics is. It's genetics is what you're stuck with. You're stuck with your factory, <coughs> um, but the way it makes different things is kind of just depicts what, what you're going to get when you get your protein. Have I followed that so far? Estrogen works the same way, thyroid works the same way, all of them work the same way. So you can fill in the blank with any, any molecule that you want. So just to kind of summarize a little bit more about insulin, the answer would be to basically decrease the sugar in our diet. That would solve everything. Um, if we went to a more kind of paleo or more um, um, Greek kind of diet or Mediterranean type diet where it's more fruits and vegetables and that sort of thing. Fruits are interesting. I always say you don't drink more fruit juice than you could eat the fruit. So when we drink a glass of orange juice, <coughs> you have to juice a whole lot of, you know, oranges to get that much juice. So, you know, if you drank as much juice as you could eat in fruit, you'd probably only have about that much fruit juice because that's about probably four or five oranges and you'd be like stuffed after that many oranges. But the neat thing about fruit is it has lots of fiber and it has lots of um, things that slow the, the glycemic load. So if you're going to have some sugar in your diet or have a treat, the best thing is, is to have some fruit because it's got you know the fiber with it. Now I know that we like treats and so the rule of thumb that I learned from um, Michelle <coughs> Berger, our uh, trainer, is if you're going to have a treat, don't have any more calories in your treat than what you want to weigh. So let's say you want to weigh 150 pounds, your treat should only be 150 calories. And when you start counting calories, that's not a very big treat, but it's, you know, that keeps you from depriving yourself. And if you think, you know, I'm going to have a treat once a day, but it's only going to be 150 calories, you know, maybe that is just a, um, you know, a couple bites of your cheesecake or whatever. And then I always say, ask yourself, is it worth the calories? If it's a day-old donut that's just sitting there, you, know, you really want to think, is that really worth the calories? So that's really important when you're thinking about your treats and your sugars. So most of your diet should come from protein, and most of your diet should come from fat, and then carbohydrates last. And then you can have all the green leafy vegetables that you want completely open. <laughs> open um, credits on that. The other thing is this whole thing with intermittent fasting is very cool. I don't know if I mentioned the Bulletproof Coffee to you guys, but if you only have protein and fat before about noon, usually your insulin is going to be at its lowest point in the morning, and we check an insulin level on all of you. We like it less than 10. If it's more than 10, we start really talking about some intervention. But if you just, if your insulin is low in the morning and you only have protein and fat, your body will become more of a fat burner. But when you have sugar first thing in the morning, not only are you chasing insulin sugar levels all day long, because then you start craving sugar again once your insulin lowers your blood sugar, but your body learns to burn sugar. So you really want to <coughs> teach it to burn fat. So in my coffee every morning, I have a, like a quarter of a stick of butter, which sounds crazy, and then I have the MCT oil, so, and then I don't start eating any sugar till about noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, and so my body says, well, there's no sugar around here to eat or burn or, you know, uh, metabolize, so let's burn this fat, so it gets used to burning fat for you, which is um, an easy little trick. 
But um, and then you want to limit the carbs that you have throughout the day as well. You said to do that in the don't have sugar until when? Usually noon or one o'clock. So the first thing we want to do when we wake up is have carbs because that's quick energy. But um, so the oil and the fat triggers a hormone called CCK, uh, cholecystokine, and it's a hormone in the gut that triggers you to feel full. So, any questions about that so far? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, oh, let me just talk a little bit about how to control insulin. There's a supplement called chromium that helps regulate your insulin resistance or your ability for insulin to work. So that's something over the counter that's in our supplement pack so you don't have to worry about getting that extra. And then if your insulin level is over 10, usually we'll stick you on <coughs> some metformin or glucophage. That's interesting, it works two different ways. It helps your insulin resistance, but it also blocks sugar. Y'all remember those chips that came out a few years ago called Elestra? And if you ate fat, it kind of went straight through you, like diarrhea. Metformin works very similar, except it blocks sugar, blocks carbohydrates. So if you eat too much sugar, it goes straight through you and can cause some stomach cramps. They make an extended release, which slows that down just a little bit, but you kind of lose the effect of the way it blocks sugar in the gut. But it also works at the level of the insulin receptors to help them be a little more sensitive, so it works <coughs> twofold. Um, but that's an interesting medication. It's dirt cheap. It's on the $4 plan at Walmart, so we use it a lot. Um, it's really great with folks with PCOS because it really helps that insulin resistance and um, helps some of that core underlying insulin problem that people have. But the name of the game really is to get sugar down as much as possible. Sugar and gluten both very similarly have, this is one thing the um, Bulletproof Coffee guy shared with me, molecules that act very similar that actually can um, go to opiate receptors and opiate receptors are are pain receptors that actually morphine and opiates and things like that go to. So the addictive centers for gluten and sugar are just like morphine. So if you've ever tried to give up sugar, it's like the hardest <coughs> thing ever. And it, it will be just like you know a heroin addict trying to give up heroin. Gluten is the same way. But the nice thing about it is if you can kick it for a good week, usually that's about how long it takes to kick it. But you can't eliminate all gluten and, well, I mean, some people try, but you can't eliminate all carbohydrates from your diet because we need some carbohydrates as a sugar source and fuel. So I don't want you to think of carbohydrates as bad, but, you know, all this stuff about high fructose corn syrup and just sticking sugar as fillers and substitutes and things and drinking our sugar, I just want you to rethink how we think about carbohydrates. Um, so I used to preach that high fructose corn syrup was the devil, and I retracted that. Have I told you all that? <laughs> high fructose corn syrup, you know, freaks everybody out. And they're like, oh, they're trying to kill us again with some other, you know, chemical. But really, high fructose corn syrup, when you break down the molecules, is, let me just tell you, sugar or glucose that we normally think of. Glucose is 50% gl table sugar is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. High fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. So it's only, you know, 5-10% difference, but the problem is they stick it in everything. And it's dirt cheap because they make it from corn and, you know, they can stick it in everything because it's dirt cheap. And it makes things taste better. So, I mean, everything tastes better with sugar in it. So just be aware when you're reading your labels, when you see that it's just more sugar that they've stuck in stuff. So, okay. Questions about insulin? So I want to talk um, a little bit about the other hormones that really affect us a lot. Insulin, of course, comes from the pancreas. The pancreas has two functions. It does our digestive enzymes, which breaks down fat, protein, and sugar. And then it also makes the endocrine function, which, are, which is insulin. <coughs> the pancreas is a busy little organ. And then we have several other organs. So I don't know if I've ever drawn you all my picture. Of Jane. I like to give her boobies because it's fun. I'd like to give her a brain. Because she's not blonde, I'm just kidding. So we have in the brain, we have a couple of organs that make hormones, and we have the hypothalamus. <coughs> That's just a fun word to say. It's kind of like hippopotamus. Hypothalamus. And then we have the pituitary.
And then anybody know what the gland in the neck is? Thyroid. Oh, I'll catch on fast. And if you happen to be a girl, do you know what gland you have down here that makes hormones? Yep. Oh, I wish I had another color. I don't think I do. And then there's one more little set of glands that sit down here in the belly. Does anybody know what those are? Yes, very good. Our stress hormone glands. And adrenaline comes from the adrenal glands, which is stress hormone or fight or flight hormone. So also, just want to point out that there's one little layer in the adrenal glands tiny little layer that interestingly makes ovarian hormone. So that is why sometimes after hysterectomy or after menopause you'll hear, well my grandma never had any hot flashes and she never had any symptoms of menopause. I think most people think of menopause as hot flashes so you know a lot of times they'll have weight gain and trouble sleeping and all mood swings and all sorts of things that they're not thinking about associated with menopause. But um, if they don't have any of that and they transition through menopause or hysterectomy just fine, it's because they have really healthy adrenal glands and that one little layer is compensating. Because you would die without estrogen and progesterone and testosterone and all those hormones. So the adrenal glands are very helpful. Now the issue is that if your adrenal glands, if you're all stressed out all the time and your adrenal glands are busy making stress hormones from the rest of the gland, it doesn't have a lot of reserve left over to make things. So you'll really see people who have a lot of high stress or who don't manage or cope well really struggle through menopause and hysterectomy because, you know, just the cortisol production and the adrenal glands are just burned out and you just can't make any more. So all of these hormones constantly feed back with the brain and they're messaging saying make more or make less. Okay, so just like we talked about the thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH from the, the brain, the ovaries have FSH and LH, which are feedback hormones about how much estrogen and progesterone and all that stuff you make. So, all of these interact the same, and just like you saw when I drew the picture of the molecule of the hormone just a minute ago, they all go into cells and they all interact and talk with each other. Receptors can be very similar. Things can get a little bit confused. So, you'll have to excuse my PTSD but I hated organic chemistry. <laughs> Take a breath. I'm going to draw a molecule. <laughs> Anybody ever take organic chemistry? Yeah. Uh, no. I didn't have to. This is a molecule. <laughs> So this is an oxygen and a hydrogen molecule. There's a hydrogen. This could be any molecule. This is probably no molecule because it's really funky looking. But um, So in organic chemistry, they made us memorize all these structures and all these things. And I, I hated it because I'm just not a memorizer. I have, it has to have some practicality. And since I can't see these molecules, they don't make any sense to me. But the interesting thing about this is all you have to do is change a hydrogen or an oxygen or a carbon and all of a sudden you have a completely different beast. Okay, So the pharmaceutical companies figured this out and they could change a hydrogen or an oxygen molecule and you can't patent a hormone because God made hormones and only God has a patent on that. But they could change it just a little bit and then they could make some money off of it. So you know we are sort of victims of the pharmaceutical companies doing just that. And it's just enough of a change to really cause some ugly differences. For example, if you give synthetic progesterone, you can cause birth defects and miscarriages. If you give natural progesterone, you can actually um, promote a pregnancy and keep a pregnancy viable and healthy. So it's a completely different beast and acts completely different. Not to mention that um, the molecule Premarin, which came from pregnant horse smear urine molecules, and then they made a synthetic version of it by tweaking it a little bit. Those equine or horse properties, we weren't meant to eat horses, and we certainly weren't meant to have horse hormones in our body. So um, there's carcinogen properties to that. So okay, the interesting thing is, let's say that this molecule is a 
cholesterol molecule. Cholesterol comes from fat. Fat is not bad. Fat is good. Fat stimulates us to feel full too much. Fat is bad. And fat with sugar is bad because the body gets confused and then it wants to store the sugar as fat. So the cholesterol molecule is the root of all your hormones. And that first little picture shows you that the cholesterol molecule is the root of all your hormones. And then we have these things called enzymes. And the enzyme, oh, I don't even do that at the house, can change the structure So maybe it looks like this. And now all of a sudden, this molecule, we can call this progesterone. You with me so far? And now we use another enzyme. And we change it just a little bit more, depending on the body's needs. And now we have estrogen. You starting to follow? Now, interestingly, progesterone, I'm just going to kind of shorten this a little bit, whatever that looks like, can become cortisol. So if your body's under constant stress, and you're constantly having a need for more and more cortisol, or you have inflammation in your body and more and more cortisol is being elicited, can you see that if you're drawing everything from over here into cortisol, you don't have enough estrogen, progesterone, the things you need over here, okay? So that's the interesting thing about the overlap between the adrenal glands and the ovaries and the testes in the male, is that these hormones can change and go back and forth. So. That's the reason we spend so much time talking about stress and coping mechanisms and feeling happy because if you're stressed out all the time and your body's needing cortisol all the time or you're sick and have chronic disease because your nutrition state's not good, you're going to be pulling all your hormones over here. The other thing is most traditional medicine, if you go have your cholesterol checked and it's high, what's the first thing they want to do? Give you the cholesterol medicine. Cholesterol. Yeah, and lower it. And it's actually the bad cholesterol molecule, what we call the LDL. There's really no bad cholesterol. There's LDL and HDL, and, and they those molecules either carry fat into the cell or they carry fat out of the cell. They're not good and bad. And they have shown that most people, statistically, anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of people who have cardiovascular stroke, heart attacks, events, have normal cholesterols. So, I mean, we're looking, but we're barking up the wrong tree, and the pharmaceutical companies love it because there are millions of Americans on cholesterol medications, but there are people walking around with very, very low cholesterol levels and not enough hormones to really even maintain their mental function. So, you know, that's the last thing that we really need. <coughs> I had a, my mom actually was dating a gentleman one time that was on cholesterol medication. He lost his ever loving mind because he just, who knows, you know, what that was doing in his mood, because it was a pl completely nice guy, started the cholesterol medicine, and he actually tried to choke her, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy that the things that we do in our bodies in the name of what we're told to do. See, they have me on cholesterol medicine, but when they did my heart cath, there was no blockage. That, that just blows me away. Yeah, yeah, it's really not. Now, there are some smaller molecules of cholesterol that can deposit in the arterial walls, but the problem is inflammation. So if you have inflammation, it acts like sticky tape for different molecules to and stick. And that's where the swelling is in my knees and stuff. Yeah, it's all inflammation. So you are at increased risk, but it's because of the inflammation. Now what they've shown is there are actually some anti-inflammatory properties to the statin drugs, which is the main body of drugs that we use for cholesterol. So it's not even the cholesterol lowering that's preventing the heart events and you know the, the strokes and things like that. It's actually the anti-inflammatory properties in the statins. So really interesting that you know it does have some properties as far as help, helping you, but the side effects are so huge because it causes all sorts of other problems with muscle pain and things like that. I know one that they had put me on years ago. Uh, cause like really low vitamin D levels and 
That causes a lot of other issues too. Vitamin D is a hormone, and it's just like all these other guys, the little houses with the little hydrogens and oxygen molecules. If you don't have enough cholesterol, you can't make vitamin D either. So the cholesterol mass is going to be what's making my knees and my legs hurt then, and my feet? Well, because it's probably causing hormone imbalances because you don't have enough hormones to, you know, make all, do all your other things, so indirectly. Makes yeah. me wonder, what should I do? Should I not take it? That would be my response. <laughs> you know, they put me on it. They put me on cholesterol medicine like a few years ago, and they they uh, I don't know. It's like a year later they wanted to do my blood work again, and they did. And they're like, I think we need to increase your cholesterol. And I'm like, yeah, increase your cholesterol medicine. And I'm like, maybe I want to start taking it first because I I forget to take it. Because you're supposed to take it at night, and I could take it. I mean, you're doing yourself a favor, but it's just my thought. There is some thought that in a certain population, especially men over the age of 40, with cholesterol levels, total cholesterol levels over 300, that there is, because it also lowers some of those smaller molecules, and if they have insulin resistance and inflammation, that yes, you should reduce that a little bit. But for the average population, especially women, I don't think there's any indication. Unless your um, total cholesterol was like four to five hundred, then I'd really start reconsidering that. You know, Mine's in, in never even over two hundred. But they keep me on this different medicine. Yeah, and you know the pharmaceutical companies fund all this research that promotes all uh, all the drugs and this the yeah, standards of care and the guidelines. <laughs> so, and I don't I don't want to not you know pharmaceutical company and all that. They need to make their money too, I guess. But. <laughs> So they could be poisoning in this too, you know. They are poisoning, yes, they are poisoning, that's for sure. So there's a little picture up here that shows you the cholesterol molecule going to the estrogen, going to the progesterone. And the neat thing that, um, and, and there's a little better picture of the molecule. <laughs> the neat thing about um, how this works is when progesterone gets converted to estrogen, when we think of estrogen, estrogen is actually three different molecules in the human body. And just to abbreviate, I'm gonna call this E1, E2, and E3. Is anybody else warm? It's a little stuffy in there. It's a little warm. No, I just had a tickle. I just, sometimes I just get out of gears. E1 is what's known as the bad estrogen because it's associated with the receptors that increase your risk for breast cancer. So I'm going to call it bad. There's really no good and bad, it's just unbalanced because E1 has some functions with bone density and that sort of thing. This is called estrum. And all of these collectively are estrogens. So estrogen is the one that got the bad rap in um, the study that was concluded in 2002, the WHI study. Um, but when we think about estrogen, there's actually three. E2 is neutral, and it's estradiol, and E3 is very protective. very uncommon to see a woman who's pregnant get breast cancer, and that's because she's got a lot of um, B3. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's very uncommon because they have a lot of E3. So anyone who's ever had breast cancer has a really high risk um, of breast cancer should know what all three of their levels are. And you want to keep the bad as low as possible, the good as high as possible, and the neutral is really the best for hot flushes and bone density and mood and all that kind of stuff. So we do have to use some estradiol. Now the interesting thing about this is that E1 if I were to draw these molecules out can go to E2 E1 can go to E3 E2 can go to E3. E2 can go to E1. 
But these arrows don't go backwards. And E3 is the good one. So we can give a woman E3 all day long, and we can help. It's very weak, but it can help her hot flashes. It can help her mood swings. It can help all sorts of things. And it's not going to turn into the bad or even the neutral. Maybe a little bit the neutral, but it's not going to go to the bad one. So really, a woman who's had breast cancer, to not give her E3 or to get her E3 levels as high as possible is, to me, almost malpractice. So, but you never hear this. You never hear about doctors doing this. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Um, Dr. John Lee, who is the guru, I'm going to pass this around, um, in California. He's no longer living. He, he wrote these books. I, I consider these my Bibles for the bioidentical hormones. But what your doctor may not tell you about, and then you can fill in the blank. He's got several titles. This one is premenopause. There's one that's menopause, there's one that's breast cancer. And I really think any woman who has, who knows anyone who's had breast cancer or at risk um, should read that one, especially about breast cancer. October's um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And you know, I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys yet or not, but kind of like Columbus said the world was round and they were like, oh no, it's flat. What I'm about to say is probably you know, going to get me burned in a stake, but I don't believe in mammography. And the reason is, is why do you radiate a breast? That does not, does not make sense. And, and so I, I'm completely on the other end, end of the spectrum with wellness that you never radiate, you never cut, and you never poison anybody. I mean, that's just old medicine. I mean, that's like when they used to, you know, bleed people and give them poison and give them, you know, arsenic and all sorts of crazy things. I mean, it's just very antiquated medicine. So I believe we have everything. Like the blood thinners they give a lot of people. It's made with rat poison. Come on, I know, it's rat poison. It's crazy. So why do you do that to people? Why don't you find the underlying cause of the inflammation? They gave it, they gave it to my mother and her feet turned purple. You remember when they were peeling? Oh. Yeah, and she came home from the hospital and her the whole bottoms of her feet peeled off. They finally took her off of it. Then. Yeah. But her feet swelled so bad that she looked like Fred Flintstone's feet, you know. She couldn't even, when I mean, she'd go to the bathroom, she couldn't even put any weight on her feet. Yeah. It was it's awful. poison. It was awful. It is awful. So I'm very non-traditional in that sense, but all of you have to make your own decisions for what you think is right for you and right for your body. Um, there are alternatives. There's thermography. Thermography detects heat in the blood vessels, so, and tumors have extra heat and extra blood supply, so you can detect a tumor up to 10 years earlier than you can with mammography. Um, there's a, the cancer industry is huge. There's a great DVD if you ever want to order it. I think you can actually watch this for free maybe on YouTube, YouTube segments, but it's called Healing Cancer from the Inside Out, and they talk about the cancer industry, and it's a multi-billion dollar <coughs> industry too. And we have the cure for cancer. It's vitamin C, high dose vitamin C, and we have the cure for prevention. It's vitamin D and vitamin C, but you know nobody's talking about that. And they want you to go through all these expensive procedures, and they want to kill you with their stuff, their poisons, and their radiation. So, um, if you, to me, if you're really concerned about breast cancer and you know you're not getting your hormones balanced and we you don't know the numbers, then consider thermography or consider ultrasound or you're going to pay a little bit more for MRI but they use radio waves so you know there's so many more safe alternatives why, why would you radiate a breast I mean they're so sensitive their, their tissues change turn over so rapidly it's just a highly changing over cellular structure and to radiate it makes no sense to me so so don't burn me at the stake <laughs> but the world really is round <laughs> So um, when we talk about these different estrogens, like I say, I think it's very important to know this. I want to back up just a little bit and, and tell you a story. There was a guy about 40 years ago who won a Nobel Prize for a research study he did on 10 patients. If I did a research study on 10 patients, they would laugh at me out of medicine. This guy won a Nobel Prize, and he was studying testosterone, and one of his patients got prostate cancer. And he made the hypothesis that testosterone causes prostate cancer. And <laughs> doctors have hung on to that faulty theory for over 40 years, and doctors are absolutely terrified of testosterone. So I want to ask you, just put on your thinking caps. Just take a deep breath, and just want you to think for a minute. And I'm going to ask you a question. Who gets prostate cancer? Yeah. Yeah. They have what, what men? 
what men usually get prostate cancer? Older men. Older, Older men. men. When is your test? When is a man's testosterone the highest? About 18, probably. Have you ever heard of an 18-year-old boy getting prostate cancer? So if testosterone causes prostate cancer, why aren't all our 18-year-olds just dying off right and left of prostate cancer? I'll tell you what, it's the same thing with estrogen, and everybody's terrified of estrogen and breast cancer. Who gets breast cancer? In fact, the numbers are right here to prove it. So by, by age 25, when you're in your 20s, you have a 1 in 20,000 chance of getting breast cancer. You, you hardly ever hear of a 20-year-old getting breast cancer, okay? But by the time you're 85, the very last, your chances are 1 in 9. And actually, these numbers are actually 1 in 8 now. They've changed this over the past two years. So your estrogen is the absolute highest when you're in your 20s. So why are these... Why are these these women going, doing this radical mastectomies yeah. when they're in their 20, early 20s, because they have the gene. Yeah. I mean, to me that's just, because if you have the gene, it can show up, because my aunt died of breast cancer. They removed her breast, but then it showed up Somehow. elsewhere in her body. So removing your breast to me is useless if it's going to show up somewhere else. Yep. Well, what if you never get it? What if you have these radical surgeries and you never, you, you might not have ever. Thought. Well, I guess you get to choose the breast size then. Or do you get the, the, genetics. <laughs> the genetics are the proportion of E1 that you make. But nobody's checking this, and nobody's talking about this, and nobody's talking about how to reduce your E1 levels. See, that's, that's the part that I, was, I just never could comprehend. And now since Angelina Jolie did it, yeah. everybody thinks they need yeah. to do it. Yeah. 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 And to me, that's just crazy. We had a lady at work that had, had it in one, and she had them take them both off. I'm like, yeah. You know, I learned my first day, I, I, I will never forget it, Biology 101 in college. The professor said, every single person in this room has cancer. I'm born with it. You're born with it. Yeah. You're born with it. Every single one of you have cancer in your body right now. Because what happens is our cellular structure turns over constantly. Now the difference is whose immune system corrects the damage that's made every time in that double-stranded DNA, every time that that factory pumps out a polo shirt or a tank top or whatever it pumps out, it has the potential for having a little misstep. And that misstep can turn into cancer in a moment's notice. So keeping everything balanced, all those hormones balanced, keeping your nutrition, all of those things is so important, but nobody's talking about all that stuff. So, yeah, you have the factory for it. The factory is always there, but it's the difference in what you do and the education and the knowledge, how you prevent it from becoming a tumor. Most tumors take about 10 years to form. So one little misstep in the DNA that's caused the changeover to happen, usually it takes about 10 years for a tumor to form. But, you know, the minute somebody gets a cancer diagnosis, they want to cut tomorrow. They want to cut it out tomorrow. They don't want to talk about how to fix your immune system and how to repair the damage. They just want to cut it out. They cut it out and it shows up somewhere else because it's in the DNA. It's not in that cell. It's in every DNA that you have in your body. So Sometimes I think when it gets air to it too, sometimes it makes it spread. Absolutely. Their tumors are fed by oxygen. Tumors are fed by blood supply. When you cut, part of the healing process is your body makes more blood vessels go to something. So the minute you cut, you're a asking for more blood vessels to actually increase growth. So we're very backwards in our thinking. And you know, a lot of countries, I think it's very interesting, they're like in Beijing and a lot of other countries, they have what they call non-medicine, -medi non non-cutting hospitals. They use faith healing. And I mean, they've gone in and they've shown prayer and meditation heal these tumors with these people that don't have any resistance. They're just little sources of love floating around and they pray for you and to me we have everything that we need. And I know this sounds really crazy and you know it's like who who's talking like that? You know, how can a medical it's not crazy talk to me like because that? my sister in law slammed her car, her hand in her sliding door on her van. The paramedics looked at her hand and didn't think they could save her fingers. They took her to the emergency room. The the nurse 
looked at her hand. Two hours later, she was praying, and they pulled the thing off, and her fingers just, she went home with Band-Aids. She believed it. Yeah. I think we've all in our lives at some point experienced some sort of miracle healing, whether we wanted to believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. We all had that potential and that power. I had a really powerful thing happen just last summer. I broke my foot, and I had I had a healing happen to me. It was, um, you know, I'll never yeah. forget it. it. healed my foot instantly. And... What's that kind of thing? You can't go back after you've had right. something like that happen. I mean, it's just it's life changing, and and every single day in our bodies that healing is happening. We just don't know it. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So, to me, it doesn't make any sense to walk around scared of cancer. One of the most diagnosed <coughs> breast cancers is something called DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, and it's. It's 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 being rampantly diagnosed. It's like you know when you hear about the one in eight women getting diagnosed with breast cancer, it's that ductal carcinoma site either or DCIS, and it's really a, a precursor to cancer. It's just some cellular changes that are happening, but you know their first response is you know you got to cut that out. They have shown that vitamin D reduces DCIS by seventy percent, seven zero percent having healthy vitamin D levels. Nobody's talking about that stuff. I mean, all of us need to be on at least 5,000 units of vitamin D a day, especially in the wintertime when we're that in the summertime. Is pre, pre-osteoporosis too? I mean, yeah, because vitamin D puts calcium in the bone. Estrogen and vitamin D are two hormones that are directly related to putting that calcium in the bone. Is that in, in our packet, vitamin D? It's not, and I'm gonna change that. I need to change that regulation, or that formulation. Um, because I want to have a little bit more inclusive, but that's very important. However, iodine is in there, and the women in Japan, I think I talked about this during their thyroid talk, have almost no thyroid disease, but they have no fibrocystic breast disease and no breast cancer hardly, because they get plenty of iodine and plenty of vitamin D as well. So those are two huge ones. And you know why we're running around mammogramming everybody instead of saying, you gotta get your vitamin D, you gotta get your vitamin D, instead of you know preaching, you gotta get your mammograms. I mean, it just makes so much more sense. So. Do you have vitamin D? We do. Yeah. So how many milligrams? How much should we take? Five thousand. I use five thousand. I, I was put on it before, but I have a really. I'm just really bad about remembering to take them because if I take vitamins without eating something, I just get so nauseous and sick. Is that multivitamins? Any vitamin. Okay. Because a lot of multivitamins have iron, and iron can make you nauseous. Have our, I, have our vitamins made you sick? I always take try and, and eat, eat something, something before I take them because it, it's, you know, I've lived with that for years to where if I try to take vitamins, I would just get real. So I do, I, I've even taken vitamins at night because I know at night I won't get sick if I, because I've eaten during the day. They don't seem to bother me, and my some vitamins do bother me, but yeah. these don't. Yeah, yours do. Yeah. A lot of, bother me. A lot of the, the cheaper ones will have a lot of iron in mm-hmm. it, and they'll have okay. a lot of fillers in it, and that sort of thing. So Maybe ours that's are, what it is. Yeah. I mean, I've got vitamin D at home, but because uh, I was supposed to be taking it, but I, I just forget to do it because I usually do like uh, my hormones at night, and then I take uh, my thyroid medicine first thing in the morning. So if I'm not, if I don't take it in the morning. Like sometime within the first few hours of being up, I'll forget to take it. You can take your supplements at night with, when you do your cream. Just stick them by your cream bottle and just do your vitamin D. And that's what I need to do. How much vitamin C should we have? I love vitamin C. I don't think you can get enough vitamin C. The problem is vitamin C will tear your stomach up, and that's one of the things. There's no vitamin C in our supplements. But I mean, packs. for somebody, if they, if they're, if they, if they, well, for instance, the reason I'm asking, and this is a 21 year old I work with, and she's diagnosed with cancer, and she's taking treatments right now, and she's sick as a horse. Oh, our vitamin IVs that we have, and you guys get two with the program, so if you haven't got them, you need to come get one. They're amazing. I haven't done it yet. <laughs> It's equivalent to about 65 oranges. It's almost 20 grams of vitamin C. If you take more than about two to four grams or two to 4,000 milligrams of vitamin C, it starts to tear your stomach up a little bit. It's a little, you know, acidic. Um, but I, I try to take four grams of vitamin C every day. It's great for the skin. It's great for the immune four system. Four grams? Four grams or 4,000 milligrams. I met a lady one time when I was in my 20s. She was in her 50s, and she looked, her skin looked as young as mine in my 20s. I'm like, what's your secret? 
She's like, I take four grams of vitamin C every day, and I'm like, I'm doing that. I want to look like that when I'm 50. I worked with a lady that was, she was in her 50s, and you're going to laugh. She used Preparation H on her face, and she looked like she was 20. There's actually she a preparation. It, I under her makeup. There's every actually day. a preparation H. You can't get it in the United States because they changed the formulation in the United States, but you can order it online from Canada. And it's preparation H with biodyne. And it's actually a bacterial culture. The cool thing about it is it takes the swelling out of things. So that's the way it really works. Because our preparation H that we have here really doesn't work. But you can use it for the under eyes, and I've seen people who have those terrible, terrible dark circles. It takes the, that right out. Oh, so. I need some of that. Yeah, it's what's cool it stuff. called? Preparation H with Biodyne. B I O D Y N E. I like to say you have to order it from like Canadian pharmacies or something like that. It's not cheap, but I think like a 45 gram tube is like 20, 30 bucks. But well, I know there's you can buy. Cool. There's like some prescription to get, because I have always had dark circles, and there's like some kind of prescription you can get for it, but it's like outrageously expensive. Some of those are, are bleaching agents, and they don't, what's no, don't what happens that. is there's, um, some people are just more prone to having vascular congestion under their eyes, and the tireder you get, the more blood flow you get because mm -hmm. you're tired. So it decreases that vascular congestion. I always looked like when I was younger and I did, when I didn't tan, when I was like 10 or 11 years old, it looked like something black my eyes. Oh, it was bad. I seen a picture of me when, that somebody took when I was real young. I was like, <gasps> it looks so horrible. <laughs> it was bad. So, yeah. That's a little more vascular. Then condition. somebody said uh, I was going to try, I don't know, get some stuff they sell on TV and uh, it didn't work. So I was, you know, like, three weeks and I didn't see a change and I called them and they said, well, if you want immediate results, you have to have surgery for that. Great. Thanks for saying. Awesome. <laughs> Just give me my money back. I'm sending the crap back. <laughs> if, your, if your hormone cream doesn't have testosterone in it, you can use it on your face and it really kind of helps with some of that vascular congestion really? and wrinkles and stuff too. But you'll get some facial hair if it has testosterone. Oh, so yeah. it's my disclaimer about that. Yeah, I don't need to be sure of it. One of the interesting things is some molecules that are in our environment act like estrogen in our body and not in a good way. Plastics, like they call it PCBs, um, they call it xenoestrogens. The molecule when you draw the molecule looks like estrogen and acts like estrogen in the body, but it's just different enough that it can really cause some confusion and some problems. <coughs> so if you can buy your fruits and vegetables organic, that's really the best because it doesn't have the pesticides on it, which also act as xenoestrogens. And I, I really caution people on soy products because soy can convert to estrogen as well. And soy converts... Sure yeah. I've been, you know, I've been reading since my estrogen was so high. I've been reading, and apparently sugar can too, and baker's yeast can, and wheat can. And yeah, and some people just suck up the estrogen, and then you make more estrogen. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. This little section here is kind of, kind of small writing, and I really don't want to focus on this a lot, but I think it's very interesting what this is actually saying is that the more good estrogen you have around, the more good estrogen receptors you make. The more bad estrogen you have, the more bad estrogen receptors you make. When they check you for estrogen receptor positive on your tumor cells, they're checking for the bad estrogen tumor um, hormone, basically. So, you know, why they, why they don't do this in traditional medicine, I just don't understand. I'm hoping that one day it catches on, because this is evidence-based medicine. You know, when they taught us in residency, you don't use any medication unless there's tons of research to back it up. There's tons of research to back this stuff up and why they choose the pharmaceutical companies. I don't really understand. I know there's a lot of money in that, you know, the money drives things. But So this is basically just saying the more good estrogen you have, the more good estrogen receptors you have. And um, you want to negate the effects of the bad estrogen receptors because when you have these receptors, they're hungry for it and they're just going to suck up the bad stuff. Also, a healthy liver clears out the bad estrogen, so you want the healthiest liver possible. And that's why I love the B12. The B12 just helps those liver cells turn over. Um, good amino acids help that liver 
cleanse, keeping your digestive tract clean, keeping things, the toxins moving through there. Exercise moves toxins through your lymph system, through your liver and out of your body. Um, you know, I, I used to hear people say, oh, you don't have to have a bowel movement every day. I really think that moving that waste through your body every day, not from the sense of just because, you know, grandpa had a bowel movement every day, but I really think moving that through. So if you're not, you should increase your magnesium because that's a smooth muscle relaxant and it will move those toxins through there because um, that stuff sitting around too long is just causing excess work on your liver. And you need your liver to clear out your bad estrogen, so that's really important. So, you know, these people that say, well, I don't need hormones. I got through menopause fine without hot flashes. There's lots of other things that good hormone balance does besides mood regulation and sleep regulation, which we know lack of sleep and poor mood causes imbalances and, and causes more inflammation. So heart disease, all sorts of Alzheimer's dementia, osteoporosis, bone thinning, all sorts of problems from low or imbalanced hormone levels. So it's not really just about um, not having hot flashes. So one of the things that come up, came out of that WHI study, one of the things was they were given women synthetic estrogen, which was causing breast cancer right and left, so they stopped the study early for that. But they were also seeing an increase in uterine cancer. I want to explain that just a minute, and this will be kind of the last concept that I... Because you guys are probably losing your attention if you're anything like me. This is the female hormone cycle, okay? And if we break it down to 28 days, and I think it's very interesting because the mammalian model is really based on sort of a lunar model. So, you know, the, the moon, the month is about 28 days. So we kind of regulate and cycle around the moon. And some of that's energetic flow and that sort of thing. But the mammalian model is a period or a menstrual cycle should only be about three days of light spotting. Have you ever had a cat or a dog, a female, um, in heat, and you don't, you probably don't even know that she was having her period, because it was probably just a couple of days, it was probably just a few spots, and it was enough that she could clean up herself, not to be gross, but, so you probably didn't even know, unless she had a problem, and then, like, I, there was, I remember this family when I was a kid, and they had to put a diaper on their dog once a month, which is really, really gross. <laughs> <laughs> that dog had some serious some problem, PCOS or some serious Because it was better than looking at it. <laughs> yeah. 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 You were getting on your car. I think my mom had a dog like, that, I mean, get off the couch. Like, it was bad. Yeah. Yeah. But Poor for thing. the most part, the male mal the million model was three days of light bleeding. I remember I had such horrible periods. I didn't start till I was about 16, and I think the reason that girls are starting earlier and earlier is because of the hormones and the food and the chicken and the meat supply and all that. Um, so I didn't start till I was 15 or 16, and I remember they were horrible, horrible cramps. It was like 10 days, heavy, heavy hemorrhaging in the bathroom, crying with cramps, and I just, you know, thought my life was in vain, mood swings and all that bloating and stuff. But I remember the night I started my period, and literally, I said, Mom, I think I've got a problem. She's like, what? I think I really got a problem. Like, I got some, like, blood. And she's like... Oh, honey, I know how to fix that. She goes to the bathroom and she gets a super plus tampon. Oh. Hands it to me and says, here, good luck with that. Oh. <laughs> that was it. That was the conversation. And so I really, you know, I kind of kind of talked to my best girlfriend about it, you know, and she's like, oh, yeah, she's, you know, I think I ended up, like, it was in, like late at night, I think I ended up stuffing some toilet paper or something, you know, so there's no way that was going to happen. But... I remember thinking that was normal, and really until I, you know, got married and into college, and my husband was like, that's not normal. Did I even really know that that wasn't normal? So, like I said, the mammalian model is three days of light spotting, so, you know, anyone who's having a menstrual cycle that's more than that, it's not normal. It might be, um, it might be what we call routine, or it might be that, you know, what's, you know, the Because you got used to it. It yeah. might be the norm, but it's not normal. So anyway, um, what happens is for these 28 days, for the first part of the cycle, you have estrogen drive, the estrogens driving this process. And then somewhere halfway in between, we ovulate. And ovulating is when we pop out an egg. And if the egg gets fertilized, 
then you have a baby. And if it doesn't, then the brain the hormone feedback that happens with the hypothalamus and the pituitary comes back in, and it says, okay, we're ready for some progesterone now. And even if you do get pregnant, it says, okay, we're ready for progesterone, progestation, because it keeps the baby healthy and keeps the baby around. So what happens is estrogen causes you to build up a lining in the uterus. So if you have a heavy period, you have excess estrogen. And that's what we see as we see a lot of girls having really heavy, long periods because there's estrogen everywhere. And when there's not estrogen, it's in the meat supply. And when it's not in the meat supply, it's synthetically being in our, our plastics and vinyls and pesticides and all the things that we're taking in. So plenty of estrogen around which then creates this progesterone deficiency, and PCOS is just basically a progesterone deficiency. And some people are more or less likely to make enough progesterone. So one of the things that we can do to get people ovulating again is give them progesterone during this time, a high-dose progesterone to feed back with the brain to get this thing back on cycle again. But the thing I want to say about this is during this study, they decided that they were giving women estrogen and they didn't really know to give progesterone to. So <coughs> wait, they were building up a lining, building up a lining, building up a lining, and after like a year or two of this, all of a sudden they've got uterine cancer because they had this lining build up and it was, there was nowhere for it to go. Because they didn't have the progesterone to make it slough off and bleed. So those cells are very sensitive in there, and so when they're in there and they don't really know what to do, they're very vascular, they turn into tumor and all of a sudden you got cancer. So they said, okay, if you've got a uterus, we've got to give you progesterone to make that slough off. So the next theory that arose from that was, I guess, their common sense, but it wasn't good sense, was if you have a uterus, or if you don't have a uterus, then you don't need progesterone. But that's like saying you've got shoes, you don't need socks. The progesterone has a very distinct function in your electrolyte balance, and that's why you get all puffy when you get PMS, or you get too much estrogen, the progesterone comes in and calms that down. So. It keeps you from swelling, it, it helps your mood balance, it helps um, sleep, it helps balance out your estrogen to keep your estrogen from getting too high. So, you know, that whole theory that these doctors just put people on Premarin, that's what happened to me. I had my hysterectomy and started on Premarin because I didn't know any different. I didn't know I needed progesterone and I gained 80 pounds. So I get it that that's not okay. So, you know, and until you're really faced with that and that happens to you, you're in traditional medicine, you just kind of go by what everybody else is saying, and it's just, it's not, it's science, and, you know. I'm glad it happened to me, I'm not glad I gained 80 pounds, but I'm glad it happened, because it made me see that hormones have everything to do with what we're doing. So, that part of the study was, you know, one of the things that also they missed the boat on, and also, just this fact that Estrogen is not the only hormone that you're lacking in after you've had a hysterectomy or menopause. The ovaries make DHEA, they make pregnenolone, they make progesterone, they make all these, they make cortisol. So there's all sorts of other hormones that, um, and that's why we check things and we supplement what, what you need basically. So it's not just estrogen. And we use the creams because the cream bypasses the liver and when it goes to the liver for metabolism, inflammatory proteins are made. We found that with bodybuilders who were taking high doses of testosterone to build muscle, they were starting to have all sorts of liver damage and liver failure. So um, we learned the hard way through those guys that you don't really give hormones by mouth. It's just not really safe to do. And keeping in therapeutic levels. Over the next few pages are some examples of some prescriptions that you'll see. Um, you'll see the term biased and triest. I never use triest. Triest uses E1, E2, and E3. I don't think there's ever a reason to give a woman bad estrogen. I don't know why why some people do, other than maybe they're just, you know, trying, but obviously don't have all the information. I just I would never give a woman E1. But you'll see bias, which is E2 and E3, and then you'll see it written out as E2 and E3. And then you'll see it written out as milligrams per mil, um, which basically a mil is the same as a CC. So if you have a syringe, you'll you know, usually pull out per cc, or if you have the topic click, you'll say one click or two clicks, and that's given distributing a cc. So when we write that, we're writing that how many milligrams you need. One of the things I see, especially doctors in this area, give very high doses of progesterone, and too much progesterone can actually cause weight gain. So um, I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying that science doesn't fit what I know, and so I'll see other doctors, you know, patients come from other doctors with scripts, so like 100, 200 milligrams of progesterone. I usually only use for 25 to 30 milligrams of progesterone. 
the gurus out in California that started the bioidentical hormones and you know started doing all that, they usually write the cream separately, the estrogen separate from the progesterone, separate from the testosterone. But I find with compliance, it's hard enough for you to remember to use it once a day. You know, if we separated it out and had to use it twice a day and had to use some progesterone here and estrogen here, it gets hard. And it's hard enough when you're cycling progesterone and counting days. Um, but if you've got all this separated out, it makes it nice because if you're really body aware, you can adjust your own hormones based on your needs. But I find that compliance makes it really hard. So that's why we combine it all in one. And then there's actually an expense issue too because every separate cream you have is you know, usually another 25, 30 bucks you gotta pay. So it's just cheaper if we put it all together. Um, and the last page are supplements that help. And when I drew out the E1, E2, and E3, there's an enzyme that takes takes um, the E2 to E1 and um, back and forth. Um, the breast cancer medications you've heard of, like the um, aromata or the uh, Arimidex and things like that, they block that enzyme. But there's a natural supplement called DIM, short for diethylmendolamine, and it's in green leafy cruciferous vegetables. So if you eat lots of vegetables, you get lots of DIM. But it blocks that enzyme going to the bad estrogen. So if you have an extreme family history or you're very concerned about breast cancer, that's one thing that you can do to really reduce your risk. It's one of the most expensive supplements, though. I think it's like 50 or $60, so it's not cheap. But I've had women who are on some of the high-powered tamoxifens and stuff like that take that and track their E1 levels, and it's just as effective as tamoxifen. But the problem is tamoxifen blocks out your other estrogens too, so you don't get the good effects from the E2 and the E3 as well. So, As far as guys go, testosterone can go backwards towards estrogen too, and a lot of times when you see men who are overweight, their testosterone levels are low and their estrogen levels are high. You'll see like the man boobs. So um, the DIM also works for that to help their estrogen conversion as well. One other interesting supplement is that testosterone, if we've given you testosterone to help with your libido, the last step of testosterone is something called dihydrotestosterone. Again, it's just a two hydrogen molecules to make that molecular structure. But it's what causes um, the prostate changes in men, like the whether the prostate enlarges and they can't pee as well. Not the prostate cancer, but the prostate enlargement. And um, also can cause some of that male pattern baldness, but in women it can cause a beard and an acne. So some people have excess enzymes that convert to that last step of the testosterone. So sometimes we'll use saw palmetto in women to block that last conversion, because we like to give you the testosterone for the libido and the energy, but we don't like to get the beard and the acne. So that's one little trick that we can do as well. That's a lot of information in there. Yeah. You guys completely overwhelmed. No, you helped me understand why I had a total hysterectomy. Because the whole lining of the uterus thing was my issue. Mm -hmm. And which causes your uterine wall to thicken and literally things start falling out. Mm -hmm. And that was my issue, but nobody ever explained to me why I had that problem, <coughs> which puts my daughter at a greater risk because she is overweight and her periods, her periods have always been bad. Always, always, always. And when she was like 14, they put her on birth control to help, you know, minimize. But I mean, and she'll turn, she'll be just as sweet and wonderful one day, and the next day she's Satan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it is just, she's always been like that. Always. And it's just. She needs to be on some cycle natural Oh, she time. does. She does. Birth control works by giving you enough levels to trick the brain into shutting down your own natural production of estrogen and progesterone. So it's synthetic and it tricks the brain into thinking you've got plenty when you don't. So it shuts down ovulation. Um, so you can imagine if you don't have your hormone balance, you're going to be a freak. I mean, that's just the way it goes, well, but really, you're not having periods. It's really, you know, she had her two, when she, after she had her, uh, her, her last baby, uh, she had uh, her tubes tied, so now she doesn't. Need, I mean, there's not even birth control. Yeah, 
So that's a perfect candidate for cyclophosphorylation. Oh, she's a, yeah, she's got to do something. So, but she's over eighteen, and I can't control that anymore. So, you can suggest it. You can share with Well, me. she doesn't have the money, so I mean, it's that's her whole thing. Is that I mean, and when you're poor, if and that just frustrates the hell out of me because we sell a product called Endocrine, which is about twenty five milligrams of progesterone. And you can buy that over the counter. You can just buy that if you, if you can get her to take it. And you just take it, you know, seven days before your period, and it would drastically change her whole. The one health. thing I do know is she's pretty. She was always pretty regular on a period. That's how I knew she was pregnant <laughs> the first time, because she was living with me at the time, and um, she's been very regular when she has it. It's just that they last for like seven, eight days, and it's heavy, to where when she was a teenager, we bought, um, that, I don't even think they sell them anymore, they're like pull-ups for, or they're not pins, but they were to wear for, they sold for, in like where you buy the pads and everything, to help you from bleeding through on your clothes, along with the pads and all that stuff that she had to wear. That's crazy. crazy. And then you get deficient in your iron. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're tired. That was, see, that was my issue. Mine, I, I always had horrible periods, and then I was always borderline anemic, and so it was just, it was like never ending. But it, you just helped to figure it out. I, I was like, wow. So I understand. But yeah, this is, I understand a lot. The implants for birth control, my daughter has one, so she doesn't have periods with the implants. Is that really messing up her? Everything is it's synthetic progesterone, yeah. Ah, okay. Let me talk. Yeah, not fun, <laughs> it is. There are two different kinds of IUDs, too. One of them secretes some, some um, synthetic progesterone, and I see so many women have problems with that one. I, st um, I still like the copper IUD. It's, it causes inflammation in the system, which isn't great, but it is, you know, an alternative to hormones, so. I'll talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay, I'm gonna go. <laughs> okay. We got a long ride. Where do you come from? Between Springdale and Fayetteville. Oh yeah, and it's raining too. I came from Fayetteville just a little bit ago, and it's yucky.